So now in this final video on ecosystem ecology, we're going to wrap up with a concept that we introduced in our introductory flowchart, and that's going to be the idea of biogeochemical cycles. So this is a very fancy term for something that's very, very important and critical to ecosystem ecology as a whole. So remember, ecosystem ecology looks at broad concepts, broad both in the sense that they're looking at the idea of energy and the things that are transferring between the living and non-living world. When we refer to bio, we are of course referring to life. And we, when we refer to geo, we're referring to the earth and the chemical processes within it. When we look at these cycles, we're basically looking at water cycle, nitrogen cycle, carbon cycle, all of these things that we've seen before, but now we actually have a nice term to actually uh, basket them into one group. So before I get into the biogeochemical cycles, we're going to look at some basic background information on this idea. We can define a biochemical, biogeochemical cycle as the following. So let's look at a basic definition here. And then we'll work off of this definition. It's the movement of matter. Movement of matter. And remember, matter is just anything that is alive and well, let's say, or even not alive in this situation. Movement of matter between both abiotic, so non-living, movement of matter between abiotic, let me rewrite that, between abiotic and also biotic components. So let's see what we can work off of with this definition. Movement of matter between abiotic and biotic components. There are four factors to keep in mind when studying biogeochemical cycles, and they are the following. We have to understand that there is going to be a biological importance to every single biological geochemical cycle, and what we mean by this is the fact that some living organism, some biology, let's say, will utilize and need the biogeochemical cycles in some way, shape, or form. In addition, the biogeochemical cycle will involve forms that are available to life. There are going to be cycles that life itself, things that are living, will need for their own productivity, for their own success, and those forms are what we will study. There are also going to be reservoirs, big sort of like uh, concepts that are going to hold a bunch of these ma this matter moving components that we see and then we'll see that when we look at the actual example in more detail and then we also have to understand the key processes behind the cycles themselves. So these are very broad general components that every biogeochemical cycle has. There are four main cycles that are of notice in general biology, and there's one that we'll look at in greater detail. The four cycles are the following. They are the water cycle, things that you've probably actually learned prior to college. Um, carbon cycle is another important one. Not the phosphorus cycle. And uh, lastly, the nitrogen cycle, which is the one that we're actually going to be looking at in great detail starting now. So there's nitrogen cycle that's important because it actually has key processes, it has a reservoir, it's available to life, and it has biological importance because it's the movement of matter between abiotic and biotic components. So let's see how nitrogen cycle plays that role over here. So let's look at the nitrogen cycle. In the nitrogen cycle, we're going to be having amino acids, we're going to be having proteins. We're also going to be having nucleic acids. All of these things contain nitrogen, and thus they will all be a part of this nitrogen cycle. And we will also be having, as a side note, a main reservoir, a main point of, let's say, entry for nitrogen and storage, and that's going to be the atmosphere. The atmosphere, as you probably already know, is mainly composed of nitrogen. And specifically, about 78% of the atmosphere is in the form of stable N2 nitrogen gas. So that's really good. We have a nice reservoir of nitrogen to work this cycle off of. This cycle involves five key steps. And we'll look at those steps in a uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 motion. First and foremost, there's this idea of nitrogen fixation. This is our first step. 
Um, again, remember this is a cycle, so technically we can start the step anywhere because we'll always end back up at the same step, but for purposes of simplicity, we'll start a nitrogen fixation. In this situation, in this step of our cycle, we are devoted ourselves to the conversion, remember matter cannot be created nor destroyed, just converted, uh, of nitrogen specifically in the form of N2 gas. Where are we getting this from? This is, of course, coming from the atmosphere, from our reservoir. And we're going to convert it into either NH3 or NH4, ammonia or ammonia, depending on the conversion that happens. And an important thing to notice is that this is what we mean by fixation. Remember how we did carbon fixation in uh, plant photosynthesis in the Calvin cycle? We fixed carbon into something better, into a sugary molecule. Well, right now, we're fixing nitrogen, and we fixed it for organisms' usage. Organisms can now utilize nitrogen. They can't really utilize it greatly, not all at least, in this form. But in these two forms, much better for organism usage. So that's good. We fixed it. In addition, in order for nitrogen fixing to occur, we actually have to utilize uh, a mediary component. Somebody has to do this fixation, and that fixation will be done by bacteria, something you're going to be noticing over and over and over again. Nitrogen fixing bacteria will be usually within the soil uh, of Earth and also within aquatic environments themselves. So aquatic environments... Uh, will have nitrogen fixing bacteria. These play a big, big role in our nitrogen cycle. A good example of this nitrogen fixing bacteria are the following. Uh, they're called rhizobium. R I Z O B I U M. This is a bacteria that fixes nitrogen. It's found in the roots of legume plants. So, roots of legumes. And they actually are great because they give nitrogen to the plant. Give, um, let's say, fixed nitrogen. That's a better way to say this. Fixed nitrogen to plant. Because the plant can't really utilize this, uh, this type of form of nitrogen. They fix it into something like ammonia or ammonium, and then the plant is very happy and thanks the rhizobium for this fixation that it just did. So that's our first step. What's next? So after fixation, we're going to do step two over here, which is nitrification. Step two is nitrification. In this step, we're going to have the conversion of what we just made. Conversion of either NH3 or NH4+. Plus. Ammonia or ammonium is going to be converted. What's it going to be converted into? It's going to be converted into nitrate. Nitrate is abbreviated in chemical form as NO3 minus. And of course, in order for this to happen, we need a mediary component. We need somebody to do this, and that's of course going to be handy dandy bacteria via nitrifying. Now they're not called nitrogen fixing, but they're now called nitrifying bacteria, and they are also found in the soil. Nitrifying bacteria in soil. So again, look how we have bacteria here and here. This is going to be a big theme in the nitrogen cycle. Next part of our nitrogen cycle is step three, which will be assimilation. So we'll do assimilation right over here. So it's going to get a little crowded. Just bear with me for a second. Assimilation of the nitrogen cycle. In this situation, what we're going to have is plants absorbing. So plants absorb that usable nitrogen that they got from the nitrogen fixing bacteria. They take that and they absorb that usable NH3 and that usable NH4, and they can even absorb um, that NO3 minus, that nitrate form that we have, and they're going to take it and convert it into and assimilate it into something. They're going to take it and convert it into, um, let's say, plants absorb NH3, NH4, NO3 minus, and we'll convert it into things like uh, amino acids. Uh, proteins will also convert it into uh, nucleic acids as well. Okay, so that's that assimilation step one, let's say, of assimilation. Step two of assimilation is when animals actually assimilate, meaning that animals come in, they see this fancy plant doing this fancy absorption and conversion into a usable protein, let's say. Sometimes we say plants have protein, right? When we say plants have protein, we want that protein. We want to assimilate that protein within us. So animals, we would say, assimilate. 
meaning that animals are going to eat, and they eat both plants, and even they eat animals that eat plants, and thus there's this assimilation process. We're taking that nitrogen and putting it within our cells and hoping that it assimilates within our cells. Thing to notice of step three is that this is the only step without bacteria, so keep that in mind. Only step of the nitrogen cycle without the utilization of mediary bacteria. So that's an important step in step three, where we take the plant absorption and conversion and utilize it for ourselves as animals. Step four is called ammonification. So we'll do step four right over here. Ammonification. Ammonification. A-M-M-O-N-I-F-I-C-A-T-I-O-N. And in this step, we're going to do the following. We're going to take waste products with nitrogen. So we take, so sometimes waste itself has nitrogen embedded within it. So take waste products with capital N for nitrogen. We're going to use ammonifying bacteria. And remember, it's a cycle. So we're going to have to actually eventually turn back into N2, right? Because that's where I started my cycle. Notice how I've been converting N2 into NH3 and then NH3 into nitrate, assimilating it, fixing it. I might be going backwards now, let's say, and that's what's going to happen. We take our waste products with nitrogen. We use ammonifying bacteria. Again, bacteria show up again to convert, to convert uh, nitrogen to a different form known as NH3, known as ammonia. So that's our ammonification process. We can take this NH3 and we can either send it to assimilation. So let me rewrite that. We can either take this NH3 and send it to an assimilation component, because look, assimilation's right here. Or we can take this NH3 and send it to over here, nitrification. Either or, because nitrification involves NH3, so does assimilation. Wherever you see NH3 needed, we can send it there after ammonification. And finally, in step five, we have denitrification. So that's our final step in our ammonia, in our nitrogen cycle. This is the conversion. It's always lots of conversions, as you can see, of NO3 minus nitrate into atmospheric nitrogen. So N2, that will go directly into the ATM in the atmosphere. And of course, who's going to do this? Who's going to be the mediary component? This will be via denitrifying bacteria. So big idea here that I can really see here is that bacteria play a critical role in the nitrogen cycle. Very easy to take bacteria, imagine a scenario where they're removed, and being asked what are the consequences of removing bacteria in terms of a biogeochemical cycle. Consequentially, from that question, I would say that the nitrogen cycle will literally not work anymore, and that would cause changes in the phosphorus cycle, the carbon cycle, the water cycle, and changes overall in the entire ecosystem. That's a good point to end this video on. Understand that ecosystems are full of many interacting components, much more so than populations, much more so than communities, because we're really now involving the abiotic and the biotic at a much grander, broader scale. We're almost done with our ecology series in Biology 115. Appreciate the interconnectedness that we see throughout ecology.